All right, here we go. Getting things kicked off uh, for the second lecture of the day, third event of the day. This is a long day. Uh, let me just make sure it's the right mic working, and it is. So let me pull down the audio in the background. Unless I guess I could keep the music playing in the background. I don't know if that's that's probably too distracting though. So anyway, hello, it's me again. I'm Dr. Whalen, and I'm presenting. This is. Uh, going to be an actual lecture, I suppose, uh, about the history of video games or a way of thinking about the history of video games or a series of speculations about an answer to the question posed in the title here, which is the first video game, question um, mark. So uh, all that's to say there's going to be a lot of different jumping off points in this lecture. So uh, it's not so much a lecture in the sense that I am going to tell you a bunch of things, but I am. It just it may introduce some things to, to learn some more about later on. Anyway, uh, if you're in the class, hopefully you had a good lunch there. Um, I had some beans. They were good. <laughs> um, so uh, I will probably need to eat more later. That was just quick. I didn't have as much time as I thought. That was really a pretty short break. So I might need to do a longer break tomorrow. Um, but anyway, hope you're all doing well and that you're walking, uh, that you're, uh, yeah, you're watching again. Yeah, welcome back. Thank you. Good to see you again, Kelly. Um, so this is the slideshow. I just shared it in, in Discord in, that, in the live stream channel. So you're welcome to take a look at it on your own and kind of uh, go through it. Um, I'm going to open it up here in the browser in full view uh, momentarily. I just wanted to show you a couple of the things, show you a couple of things that I forgot to mention in the morning stream and, and also in the Zoom conference. Um, so let's see. And I guess I, I forgot during the Zoom conference. I don't know if I really asked anyone if they had questions. So maybe hope you all are doing okay. If you, I hope you don't have any questions, or if you do, uh, I hope you answer them, or I hope you ask them. So let's take a look at one thing I wanted to mention from Canvas that I forgot to mention, which is how to contact me. Um, if you're a student in the class, or even if you're not, I mean, I doubt anyone else is watching this, but whoever's watching this, you're probably a student in the class, so you probably want to contact me every now and then, and here's how to do that. Uh, you can email me, of course, zwayland at umw.edu. Uh, I have a website, although it's not very updated. I'm on Twitter. Don't check it that often, to be honest. Um, but the main thing that you would probably want to do is send me a message in Discord, which you have access to me now in Discord uh, through our class server. Um, if you just, anywhere you see me in there, like in the online status on the right or anywhere else, if you right click on my name, you should have the option to send me a message like right in there in Discord, or you have like a messages, like homepage in Discord you can use. Um, you can do that, or just you can even uh, mention me if you at Zach Whalen in a public channel in Discord, then I will see that and then could also respond that way. And that might be good if you have a question that you think other people might want an answer to as well. Um, and that's a good way to make sure I see it. If I if you just post a question in a channel in Discord, I might not see it. But if you at Zach Whalen and then post your question, then I definitely will. So um, that's just a, I can't demonstrate that now, but that's hopefully something that you uh, understand how to do and you can do. The other thing that you should know about is um, setting up an appointment. The uh, I have an appointment system you can use to, to arrange a, a conversation and uh, that's not, I need to update that statement there, but if you click on the book now, this actually does have the correct time availability for me and you can reserve different kinds of conversations, conversations if you want to do a video conference or if you prefer text or something, you can select which modality you prefer. Uh, it, it's all fine to me, uh, but you, you can see I'm mostly available like after this class. So 2.30 to 4, uh, or two, really 2 to 4, um, depending on how long this, this lecture takes. It won't take that long. Uh, but the uh, that's my availability um, generally throughout this term. So should be plenty of opportunities for you to schedule a time that works for you. If you can't find a time here that works for you and you still and you do want to talk about something, let me know. Um, I would like to, to have a conversation with all of you at least once this term if possible, but, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so yeah, I'm not requiring it. Uh, just, you know, we'll see what it, see what happens. All right, so let me, uh, yeah, and, and again, if you do have any questions at all about the structure of the class, the goals of the class, the assignments, please ask whenever the question occurs to you. Just put it in Discord and I will try to answer it. If I can't answer it right away because I'm doing something else or lect you know, lecturing like I am now, then I will get to it, I promise. Okay, cool, so let's take a look at the, this, uh, this thing here. So let me grab a URL here. I found that I can't see what I'm doing if I make this go into full screen, so I'm going to publish it, but manipulate the URL parameters here a little bit so that I can control it better. And yeah, here we go. So this should be playing correctly. Yeah, good. And um, as you all see, I think I, I 
I think the resolution changed on my webcam, so I feel like I'm bigger than I was before. But you all are still directly above me. <laughs> I feel like it's a little laggy too. That's that's unfortunate. Um, I could have too many tabs open or something. But anyway, I'm just gonna run with it. But you can see, you know, that that's where your questions will appear if you have them. If you type them in in chat, I just noticed the online status. It shows zero online in this little widget here, but there's actually like 15 people online, or well, 10 or 12 people online in that view. So I don't know why that widget's not updating. Sorry, let me just check it over here. I mean, I'm glad to see you all here anyway, however, whoever you are, however, however many of you there are. Cool, so let me, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. I, I don't usually use this particular widget. That's the one at the very top there. Um, I just thought it would be kind of useful to see, but it's not not working so okay uh, let me go over here and close my door my kids are doing their school and stuff like right right in the other room and sometimes they uh, they make noises <laughs> so here's the uh, here we go first video game um, so as we talked about a little bit this morning this is a, a loaded question like what is the first video game means that we need to really be answering the question, what is a video game first? And as we saw this morning, this is a question with possible, lots of possible complications to it. So these are some of the things you all said this morning. I just went through and, uh, and uh, copied some things from Discord that you all posted, but I think this captures the essence of what we talked about verbally as well. Um, these are taking elements from, uh, I think, Kelly's and, and Colin's uh, definitions and, uh, I think Ben also. Um, so a game that's playable through a screen or an interactive experience in which an individual participates in a simulation or scenario in order to achieve a goal. Obviously, I've edited down what you wrote a little bit. Uh, a virtual experience in which individuals participate for various purposes, including entertainment and competition. So there's a lot of interesting keywords here, and isolating some of these keywords helps me kind of point to the key elements like I was trying to talk about on the stream or in the Zoom this morning. And these key elements are these factors that help us filter. So if we're looking back through history at all the things that claim to have been the first video game, we can decide how much these factors weigh on those, uh, the, those definitions and then use those to evaluate those claims about whether, whether or not this is actually the first video game. So you'll see what I mean. Um, these to me were some of the key words that I saw you all talking about in these definitions and that came up in our conversation. So a screen seems to be important and I, I agree. Interactivity seems to be important. Simulation is also important and even goals. I would offer that in many cases you have one or the other. Um, so often you do have both too, but sometimes you might say that there's just one or just the other and I think you would still probably recognize something as a video game, but simulations, uh, like being like a situation. Think of things like SimCity, right? So SimCity is a simulation without necessarily goals. Like you can create your own goals for it, but it's really about the simulation. But anyway, that, that's getting ahead a little bit. Um, a virtual experience. So that's kind of getting into the idea of interactivity, but it's interactivity within a simulation. That's usually what's implied by that word virtual. It's an interesting word. So a virtual experience means that there's some kind of there, there that we are participating in and being part of, and that's that interactivity uh, that I think you're talking about in that. And then, as you mentioned, entertainment, competition, these are possible purposes. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of possible definitions, and I think this is um, a good starting point. I think you've got all the things that I would, um, that I would use. I think you, there are some ways in which other elements are necessarily implied by what you're talking about here, like interaction implies some uh, method of interaction, and usually that's a physical component, a physical support for interaction, like a mouse or a controller. And um, it's conceivable that you could have something that is not physical to control a ga game, but even in those cases, you often have like a simulated physical thing that you're in interacting with, if that makes sense. Um, but that's especially tricky when you look at things like text adventure games. So anyway, uh, moving on. Um, here's a definition I found from the OED. This is the Oxford English Dictionary, which is um, probably the closest thing to an official dictionary of the English language and um, very, very massive, very thorough. It does a lot with etymology, so it's really interesting to look at an entry like this and see when it was first used. Um, I don't have OED pulled up on this computer. I might have it on this one, not the other computer here to my left. Uh, I don't have any more, but the um, 
if I remember correctly, the first use it cited for the term video game was 1973, which sounds about right. And so that's, uh, that's interesting. Also interesting to notice here that this definition, they've, they've included this as two words, video space game. And I actually find myself going back and forth about how I, how I feel. I actually got there, yeah, like many, many years ago, I ran a blog and we got, got into this big debate about uh, the, whether it's a video game or like whether that's two words or one word, video game. And you will see both used. Um, that's a co question maybe would be an interesting discussion for a class, like which, what do you think? Um, and I think I, I go back and forth and I do use them interchangeably, but the idea of it being a video space game seems to be that it's a game modified by video. So it's a game first, it happens to be the kind of game that requires video. And that's a different sense of the word than I think we often mean when we talk about things like this, uh, where we're talking about a really, really a novel media experience, like a new thing that doesn't have a clear precedent. Like there are certainly precedents. There are certainly things that we're building on, but this is a, a break from those precedents and it's important and it's significant and it's different. And that difference is more, uh, is more visible if we spell this as not video game, but well, I don't have it, <laughs> I can't edit this here, but video game as one word. So think about that and decide what you think. Like, how are you gonna write it whenever I ask you to write this? Video game, video space game or video game, right? It might make a difference. Anyway, uh, but this is how OED, OED defines it. A game played by electronically manipulating images produced by a computer game on a monitor or other display. Now, usually a program running on a games console, personal computer or mobile device, also a software package for such a game. Um, this is a much narrower definition than what you all included. So things like Zork, I think are totally out of the question. Uh, whereas I think Zork is considerable and, and debatable, um, this definition definitely excludes it because it says images. If you don't know what Zork is yet, don't worry about it, we'll get to Zork. But that's a game that does not have images. It's just text, you type words and you read words and that's all you're doing when you play the game. But it is a game, uh, whether or not it's a video game, you know, doesn't really matter, but I think it does fit several of the definitions that you all proposed this morning, but it fails this definition that OED provides. So um, let's take a look at some games. And what I have basically are several candidates, and these are not listed in any in a order of priority. Um, I kind of just went off the top of my head, so maybe there is a sense of like subliminal priority to these, but I'm just proposing these as candidates, and then I'm going to ask you to decide what you whether you think they actually count or not. Uh, for each of these, I've got a short description and in some cases, um, a uh, like a demo of it. So we'll take a look at these shortly. So yeah, uh, sorry, just in the chat here, you all are asking about um, uh, the, the, the spellings. Yeah, spell check is not going to recognize video game like one word, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> it'll get it'll be its own word eventually. Some di some dictionaries do include it, um, but I guess the OED does, does the OED does not, or at least it didn't come up when I pulled it up. Anyway, so candidate number one, computer space. Computer space is 1971, and uh, well, it, it was uh, first uh, put up for sale and distributed and installed in 1971. And this is what it looks like. So this is computer space. It's a game, an arcade game. Uh, it's what we recognize now as an arcade, stand-up arcade cabinet. And this was placed in arcades. And arcades existed uh, before video games. Arcades were mainly, you would be playing things like pinball and, uh, and other kinds of um, amusement devices. In these places, you put your tokens in, you have fun. Um, so computer space, when it was sold by Syzygy Engineering was intended for that kind of market, and that was the kind of market that Nolan Bushnell knew pretty well. Nolan Bushnell was the founder of Syzygy Engineering, and then later uh, that company became uh, became Atari. So uh, it, they were much more successful with their second game, which was Pong, but computer space was uh, pretty noteworthy in terms of visibility. As you can see from these, uh, the flyer here on the left, it's got a very striking just physical design. Like the cabinet is something that if you see it in an arcade, you are definitely gonna notice it. Like even now, like if you happen to see one, um, and I mean, they were not super popular by comparison to like Pac-Man or anything, but 
uh, they were popular enough that there are several, and it's not out of the question that you might see one in an arcade or in a, a maybe a computer museum kind of exhibit someday. Um, but a very striking, a very sexy design, I should say. Uh, it's it's almost like sensual in the curves, but very like science fiction-y and space age with the, the glossy kind of glittery um, coat, uh, paint on it. Um, this, this one on the right, I think, is the second version of it, Computer Space 2. Um, but the ad with the woman there, like it's a, it's a classy ad. It's you know definitely looks very different than advertisement for home consoles about the same time, uh, that, you know around the same same uh, time period of the early 70s. Um, but also even just the idea of the arcade game being something that is primarily marketed for teenage boys is something that doesn't exist yet, and also you know wasn't always a given. And so this is kind of you know this is a a, a high end consumer a luxury kind of. Uh, device. Um, and this is a video, I'm going to see if the, I'll mute the sound because I don't know what's actually in here, but you can find videos of people playing it on YouTube. Of course, uh, this is somebody kind of walking through different parts of it. I wanted you to do see the gameplay um, mostly and you control, sorry, this scrolls back. Um, you control a computer, you know, you control, uh, well, as you can see here from the instructions, you control these uh, spaceships and you try to shoot the other ones. Uh, very straightforward gameplay in terms of the kinds of things that we are used to seeing. Um, conceptually, it was based on Space War, which I'll, I'll talk about in a couple more slides down here, but it's definitely different um, in terms of uh, how you play it and also how it's built. So Space War was is a game program for the PDP system and it's actually software. Uh, computer space is technically an analog computer. So if you look at it, um, in, if you look at the circuit board, I don't have a picture on hand, I should come, I should find one of these. If you look at the actual circuit board for computer space, you can actually see the graphics on the circuit board because that's how it renders these graphics is by like how long is the lead to this particular diode and that's where a dot appears on the screen. And so it actually, um, it's, it's a physical computing system. Like you can't actually emulate it because it's not software, it's not code, it's wiring. And so you can simulate the wiring, but you would have to write code to simulate the wiring. Or you could just, you know, as you can see here, watch videos of someone playing it on YouTube, which is easier to do. Um, but it, really an interesting thing, kind of a confusing game to play and kind of hard. Um, I could not find a clip of it, but the this game is also noteworthy for appearing in the the film Soylent Green. Uh, it appears in an early scene in the film Soylent Green, uh, which is a, a you know a really <laughs> dark movie. Um, it's a 1970s science fiction movie, uh, so it's it's got a lot of themes of uh, uh, you know it's, it's fairly cynical and and uh, pessimistic about the future basically. And uh, you know Charlton Heston has the famous line at the end where he reveals, and this is a spoiler alert, but he reveals at the end Soylent Green as people. Right, so that's the famous movie, but early on in the scene, early on in the movie, as a symbol of decadence and luxury, uh, there's one of the wealthier people, I forget what the wealthier people are called in that movie, but he's in his apartment and he's presenting his mistress with a computer space arcade game as an amusement, just as a, as a symbol of how wealthy he is. He's got a computer game for her. Meanwhile, everyone else in the, the world is starving. Um, again, a very complex and ultimately depressing movie, but you know, it is the first appearance of a video game uh, or arcade game at least in a movie. So check it out if you can. I, I couldn't find it on YouTube. It's been, there used to be a clip of it on YouTube, but it's been taken down. I'll see if I can find it later. Um, okay, so that's one possibility. And there we go. Uh, here's another candidate, as I just mentioned, Space War. Space War predates um, computer space by 10 years. So uh, in terms of chronology, Space War certainly is earlier, but there are some important differences to keep in mind with Space War. So Space War is designed to be played on a, a CRT monitor like this. Uh, this is a CRT, CRT monitor attached to a PDP-1 computer system. These are so-called mini computers, meaning they're only the size of a refrigerator as opposed to the size of a room. Uh, but these kinds of computers were available at research universities like MIT. Um, these are essentially surplus as uh, other systems like DARPA, like, like government kind of institutions like DARPA are moving on to more advanced systems. They are kind of uh, passing on these smaller systems to research universities. And essentially, there's a, a group of grad students at MIT that find this PDP-1 uh, that no one else is using or that they, they, they get access to it anyway to experience, just to play around with it. And um, if I remember correctly, they were actually f friends because they were the model train club 
and then that's how they got into hacking on the PDP-1. And then uh, they were using it to control their track switching programs for their model training club. And then they also like invented video games. Um, so they came up with this game that you could play on the PDP-1 and you can see it displayed here. Um, you can actually play it. So here's a link and I'll put the link here or, well, I can't click on this or else I'm just gonna go ahead. I'll just type it in the Discord chat. Um, you can actually play it yourself. Um, it is software, so it's, you, it can be emulated meaning the software, the code for the game uh, can be run in a browser-based system that emulates the PDP-1. So there you go. Um, and so take a look at it I and mean, check it out. Feel free to check it out while I'm talking. Um, it's not, I'll, I'll, I might move on, but go ahead and check it out if you want. Uh, it is a two-player game, so you can try it yourself as a one-player, but it works better if you have someone to play um, play with you. So, um, But check it out. This is a screenshot from the game. Um, it takes a minute to kind of figure out the controls even on the, the emulator. So I'll just go ahead and describe it for you. These two things here, this like triangle shape thing and then this rocket shape thing, these are uh, the, the two controllers. These are the two things you're controlling. And there's a gravity effect that's pulling you towards the center. But if you fire your thrusters at the right angle, then you will avoid crashing into the sun. And then as you fly around, you will also learn that you can shoot a missile at your opponent and destroy them if you if they hit your missile. Um, you can also hyperspace and jump to different points on the screen, I think. I don't remember if this version implements that, but there is a version where you can hit, you can jump around to a random point on the screen, which sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. So um, these are things to to try out um, as you get to it. So yeah, that's a good, so uh, Al Coffin, Colin there just shared an image of a, of a larger computer, I've got one. I've got an image like that for another example in a minute. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what those transistor transistor and vacuum tube based systems are. What what PDP systems, digital systems like PDP, were replacing. So yeah, <laughs> pretty interesting, right? So um, this. Uh, let's see what else was I going to say about this. Um, yeah, another thing that's actually really hard to display on the screen. Another feature that's that's important, but that you can kind of see here is that this is a vector display as opposed to a raster display. And it's, uh, I don't have a good graphic to explain this, but, um, and I don't have my vectrix here either, but the, uh, the uh, cathode ray tubes, these are old TVs. If you think of like big TVs that have the deep back to them, uh, that's the cathode ray tube that's projecting light at the screen to make the image that you see when you watch TV on those old TVs, right? So. In, when you watch TV, that signal is a grid. So it's gonna project, it's gonna spray light into a, a row by row grid pattern to make that picture. Um, and it sprays it kind of you know, in, in a sweeping motion like that, back and forth, kind of a S shape. Um, that's a, a raster program, raster means grid. And so that's a, a, a most CRTs are set up to be um, raster based displays. However, that's not the only option. And uh, this, the, the CRT that you see here and that you see in certain arcade games like, uh, like Space, not Space Invaders, um, uh, Tempest, um, Star Trek, uh, these are games where it, instead of drawing a grid and only lighting up pixels that it needs to display whatever sprite it wants to display, um, the vector system says, do a point here and then a point here and draw a line between them. And so the, the uh, the electron gun in the back of the CRT only sprays light right there to right there and it draws that line and the result is that it's really crisp and it really it's and it transitions really smoothly um, I have a game system uh, in my possession called a Vectrix which is, is that it's a home system that's a, a, a custom uh, CRT cabinet kind of thing but it's about this big um, it, it's broken, so uh, uh, hopefully I can get it working and show it to you, but it's it's really, you, you almost have to experience it in person to appreciate how how different a vector display is from a, a raster display. And there was a time in the, the late 70s where everyone was like, everyone thought that vector displays would be the future, and uh, they were trying to figure out how to make them generate more and more realistic imagery, but the problem with the vector display is that you can only do polygons, basically. So you have to have really, really small polygons to make anything look even remotely realistic. You need a lot of computing power to do that, and it just never really came together. And now, of course, CRTs are basically um, dead. Like, there's no, uh, no one's making new CRTs. So, um, at least I don't think they are. But certainly, you can't go buy one at, at Best Buy. So, um, anyway, this is a, it's a, it's a very, I just wanted to convey how different, and you can kind of see the difference with this particular image because 
you can see that this little spiral here in the middle is where um, you see like, like someone's ship has drawn around a circle, but that little afterglow is the resonance of the phosphors in the CRT screen. So these are little cells that receive the electron spray and then illuminate whenever they're um, electrified by that, that electron <laughs> getting sprayed at them. And they, re they retain that a little bit. Like they retain, even after the electron gun moves on, it retains that glow for a couple seconds and you can really see it and it really it makes it feel a much, like a smooth kind of almost like a motion blur kind of experience when you play it it's it's really hard i don't think i'm, I'm doing it justice i think you, you just have to experience it yourself sometime uh, but anyway crt and uh vector the the difference between vector and raster is a really important distinction uh, in the early days of uh, game systems but now everything's raster so uh, but what you see are uh, you can simulate a vector display it just doesn't look very good on a raster uh, display. Okay, so here's another candidate. This is Galaxy Game, and <laughs> Galaxy Game uh, is also from 1971. So you remember Computer Space, 1962. Um, Galaxy Game is from 1971. It is from earlier in 1971 than Computer Space. I don't have the exact dates off the top of my head, but Galaxy Game was installed first, and I say installed because there is one of it. Um, this is, uh, whereas Computer Space made uh, several hundred at least, um, to distribute and sell and install uh, Galaxy Game, there was just one of it, and but it still it it wins like it won the race. It was done first. So here's a picture of it, um, and it's basically multiplayer space war. So the idea is that you sit down at this console, everyone, and there are up to eight of these consoles connected to the same PDP-11. In this case, now we've upgraded to the PDP-11, and you control a spaceship, and you're fighting with everyone else that has access that's connected to the same console. So it's basically like a LAN game. You're sitting there playing against people there, multiplayer. Um, it costs, uh, I believe, 10 cents to play, uh, or you could get three lives or three ships with 25 cents, and that was it. Um, the biggest challenge to it is that the, uh, actually, this is, uh, I think some video gameplay here. Uh, and you can see the problem, that flicker that you're seeing, that's the problem of trying to represent a vector display in a raster context like we're seeing here. So this is a emulation in MAME, which is only raster based. And so it's trying to do that here and that flicker, you, you, just, you can't get rid of it basically. Um, uh, but you would not see that flicker at all in a vector display. So actually that's really distracting me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause that. But you, know, you saw the idea there. Basically the PDP-11 is a big system. It's another fridge sized system. You can connect these giant terminals to it, um, but that's not very, portable, certainly, and it's also pretty expensive and to set up and difficult to maintain. Um, but it, it does apparently still work. Uh, it's installed at the Computer History Museum at Stanford. And um, I, last time, it's been a few years now, but I emailed somebody about it a few years ago, and they say they turn it on every now and then, and it still works. Um, the, uh, but yeah, it, it was never successful as a commercial product, mainly because of its, uh, its size and its cost to set up and get running uh, to begin with. But if we're looking for the first, if we're looking for firstness, this has all the criteria. We've got a game, we have goals, which is like not, to, your goal is to shoot other things and not, um, not get shot. Uh, you have a fictional scenario of outer space. You have a fictional interaction with that space by controlling a spaceship. Uh, you even have it, uh, it's a commercial product, like it's an artifact, like it's a text and uh, because you're, you're asking people to pay money to experience it. So it has all the criteria, I think, of a video game. It certainly predates computer space um, and definitely is based on Space War though. So, you know, we have to decide between those two, but um, definitely uh, wins in terms of the first commercial arcade game. Excuse me. Okay, so let's take another look at something else. Here's another candidate, and this is taking us out of the arcade and into the home system. Uh, this is the brown box, and this is this actually looks like an illustration of it, but um, you can see it's an illustration of the display of it at the Smithsonian American History Museum up in DC. Um, if you ever get a chance, it's usually on display. I don't know if it is currently, actually, I don't know if the museum is even open right now, but um, it, it's there, um, and uh, I've seen it. It's pretty cool. This is a this is the prototype. This was built by someone named Ralph Baer, an engineer and inventor who uh, patented this device and several others, and therefore is considered technically and even legally the father of video games. Um, so he made this in 19. This is a 1967 version of the Brown Box. Um, it would later 
end up getting sold as, I think I have a slide of it somewhere. Yeah, so this is the Magnavox Odyssey. This is the system that the brown box became when it was a commercial product. And this is the system that I mentioned earlier. This is like some of the advertising for the Magnavox Odyssey had to essentially convince people that this was a thing that they could have in their home or like explain to them what it actually was. And you know, you can see different things about this that look kind of quirky, but definitely resemble other consoles that you might be more familiar with, like an Atari 2600 or a Nintendo Entertainment System. You've got sort of a boxy thing, you've got a wire and then a controlly thing. And you know, that's that basic formula hasn't changed that much. It, you still, I mean, we, that's still basically what we do now, even though everything's pretty much wireless or Bluetooth in terms of controllers for consoles. But I think there's some pretty interesting design features of this, and you can see it right here. So if you look along the strip, there's a strip of wood paneling here, like, and it's a sticker. This is not actually made of wood, uh, except it's made of it's probably made of uh, um, particle board. But the actual like veneer here is just meant to look like it's made of wood. Uh, the same thing on the top of this controller, and you can see that as an echo of. Yeah, uh, the original brown box design. This is uh, contact paper or shelf paper. I don't know if you've ever, you know, put this kind of thing in, or if you have it in your home. But it's often useful to put essentially a big sticker that looks like wood on top of something that you might think might get wet sometimes. So you put it there in case like it gets wet, it'll just dry instead of soaking into the wood. So this kind of contact paper, um, that's what this is. This isn't like solid oak or anything. Um, and the the story Ralph Bear tells about this is. He just did that because it was laying around. Like that's the contact paper he had. He recognized that it needed some protection. So he just put this contact paper on it. But what he accomplished here is something, he's created something that looks like it belongs in a 1970s living room. And uh, that wood paneling goes a long way to, to doing that. Um, you can't see, but this room that I'm in right now was also built with, I think this was, no, this room is is newer. There are other parts of this house that I'm in right now that were built in the 1970s, and they have wood paneling on them. Uh, but wood paneled walls were pretty much ubiquitous, especially in the den or the place where you would have your TV and your uh, maybe your fireplace and your stereo, and that's where you would play games. And so video games, video game console designers understood that environment that these things would exist in, and they designed them accordingly to look like they belong. And so this idea of wood paneling really is meant to be part of that uh, milieu of wood paneling, and it's you know it worked. Um, a few years ago at UMW, this is probably this probably predates any of you, but at UMW, um, if you know the Convergence Center on the fourth floor of the Convergence Center, uh, just as you step off the elevators, there is a space that we have used over the years to ha uh, to put some video games. Uh, it's been called the console living room, and in our first version of that, me and Jim Groom, my collaborator on that. We actually built wood paneling walls and installed them in the the convergence center uh, in that corner, and in, and basically built an entire living room there. It was great. It was a ton of fun to work on, and it, you know the idea was to simulate a 1970s living room, and I think it worked really well. Some of that material, by the way, um, Jim still has, um, but we had to take the wood paneling walls down. Uh, we were told because they were a fire hazard, and they. That's true, I'm sure, but it was it was the kind of thing we did it without asking permission, and then the uh, fire safety inspector was like, "No, you can't do that." So um, we just we took it down eventually. Uh, but here's a video of Ralph Bear actually demonstrating the brown box, and you can see him here playing it. This you might have seen this. This video has a pretty famous moment in it that some people have used as a GIF and you know described it as the first rage quit in video game history. Um, as you'll see, as it plays along here. Ralph gets a little frustrated and uh, walks off, but he's not really that frustrated. He's just kind of playing around. Uh, but he's playing a, a game here that, as you can see, looks very much like Pong. Uh, two, two paddles kicking a, a ball back and forth, just like the LED thing that Colin showed us on the, Zooms, uh, the Zoom call earlier. Same concept. Uh, Pong, the, the video game that, that we recognize as the, the arcade built, the arcade game built by Atari uh, wasn't until 1972. Um, this was, this video here that we're watching was recorded in 1969, uh, but this device that he's holding and demonstrating he had been working on, um, he says, since the late 1950s. So, but he got a patent for it in the 1960s, and then, you know, it, it kind of went from there. He had a hard time finding a company that would actually make it, and eventually, uh, like, he was working for RCA at the time that he worked on it, but then he ended up finding uh, that RCA wasn't interested in it, um, and then, but Magnavox took a chance on it and, you know, produced the Magnavox Odyssey console. 
Um, and that's it, right? <laughs> so, and this is something like uh, Colin kind of mentioned this on the Zoom too, but uh, or I, I mentioned it in response to them. But when this was released as the Odyssey, the idea is that that's the, that's just light. So you have um, it's essentially like a vector system in that it's only splitting light at those points that it needs to illuminate. And then you would stick a transparent overlay on your TV that would make it look like tennis or hockey or there's like a haunted house game. Um, and that's how you would create the fictional scenario of the game. So very minimalist graphics, obviously, but perfectly effective at conveying the idea that you're playing tennis. And I think that's definitely noteworthy. Um, so yeah, there's, there's the brown box, TV unit number seven. Okay, so another candidate, speaking of tennis, is Tennis for Two. And Tennis for Two is something that is a little bit different, kind of like Galaxy game. There was only one of it. Um, and this is a, a um, what do you call it, a mock-up. This is not the original, uh, but you can kind of see how it looks physically here. And there's a video of it here in the next slide. Um, but it controls, uh, this is one of the controllers. You have this knob, the potentiometer, that moves your... Um, virtual position if you imagine like you don't actually see the paddles but like if you imagine a virtual paddle moving back and forth you control that with that knob on the left and then you push the button to trigger hitting it uh, hitting the ball back uh, very similar actually to the gameplay in Wii Tennis uh, where you're not really controlling where your player is left and right but you control when it swings and that's kind of what you have here and it's, it was built in 1958 it's an analog set up so it's not actually software it's not programming it was just wiring set up and configured in a certain way to, to make this this effect um and you know that's why there was only one of it it wasn't something that ever could have been a product um, but you know it exists uh, william higginbotham is the engineer who put this together and i believe this is yeah this is gameplay of it you can see it going back and forth here um i mean a pretty compelling simulation of physics if you look at how the bounce um changes speed throughout the parabola Pretty interesting. Uh, what is YouTube telling me? Sorry, YouTube thinks I'm interested in, in a television game, and I am. I'll look at it later. And television is another one of those consoles. I'm, I'm gonna talk about consoles tomorrow, but um, I own an Intellivision console, or I used to, but I can't find it. So if you see an Intellivision console laying around somewhere, it might be mine. Um, anyway, uh, the I think it actually is on campus somewhere. So, you know. <laughs> Let me know if you find it. Um, it might have been stolen, actually, but I don't think so. Anyway, that's how it looks, tennis for two back and forth, but never intended to be a, a commercial product, but by virtue of its uh, early date, 1958, it's important in a legal sense because lawyers attempted to invalidate Ralph Baer's patents by saying that this was, this was prior art. So they had to try to prove in court that Ralph Baer knew about tennis for two um, when he made TV game unit number seven. And they were not able to prove that ultimately, and so his patent still stands. But um, you can see it certainly has a similar idea that uh, that Willie Higginbotham was working on. And, but maybe just the idea of tennis is intuitive, you know. Um, Nolan Bushnell had to make a similar uh, set of... Um, I mean, Nolan Bushnell apparently did see this demo. So that's uh, that makes sense uh, in terms of... Yeah, first get it. You know, and so derivation is sort of what we see here, right? The things being derivative, um, and maybe there's just something inherent to the idea of tennis as like the easiest thing to do. Certainly, it's compelling. Certainly, it's fun to play. So maybe that's why people keep doing it, or they they kept doing it, or kept, as multiple people came up with the same idea at about the same time, right? Uh, so yeah, tennis for two. Let me see. Gotta get focus on here. Okay, so here's, here's another candidate. Candidate number six. Uh, this is. OXO, yeah, sorry, my, my slides are getting weird. Um, OXO, and this is, to go back to the uh, earlier characterization of systems, like this is um, 1952. So in 1952, we were talking about much larger computers. So this is EDSAC, and EDSAC is a, it's based in the UK, and I don't remember where exactly it was housed, but this is a picture of EDSAC. And as you can see, this is a, this is a room. I mean, these are like eight feet, six to seven foot tall racks that the different components of this computer are installed on. Um, and this, like a lot of computers, and this is, this is worth mentioning, even the PDPs, a lot of these things were around and developed initially for the, the war effort, for World War II. Um, so a lot of the investments that the uh, UK government made in computing in, during, during the war, during World War II, was towards cryptography, like towards trying to crack German codes 
And so then they had all this stuff and then they were able to use, find other applications for it, including business applications, um, but also pure research applications like what led to OXO. Um, and it was a popular thing as people like Claude Shannon and Alan Turing were trying to figure out what to do with computers. Um, one of the challenges that those pioneers set forth was to try to get computers to play video games, or not video games, but to play games. Like, so a game, uh, a computer that can play chess, a computer, computer that can play checkers. Um, these were things that researchers figured out how to do or, or tried to figure out how to do. Um, if you know anything about checkers, it's a game that is considered solved, meaning there is a perfect strategy, it's just very complex. Uh, chess is a game that is not solved, as I don't think anyway, um, in a computational sense. So it was, it, it remained a challenge for quite some time to program a computer that could play chess competently. Um, Tic-tac-toe is a game that is solved and actually it, it's it's trivial. Like you, if you're paying attention, whenever you play tic-tac-toe, you're not gonna lose uh, as long as you're paying attention. And uh, it's pretty easy to program a computer to pay attention that way. Uh, even a computer like EdSac. And there is a simulation, I have a link to it. You can download it and install it. I couldn't get it running on this computer um, earlier, or I did, but I couldn't get it, I couldn't get the output of it into OBS. So I, I will just, I'll fiddle with it later. But if you feel like trying it out, it's here. Um, I'll go ahead and put this link in the, uh, in here. It's a cross-platform simulator. Here's, Yeah, feel free to try it out and see. It's uh, it's very very slow. It's very noisy, <laughs> you know. But it's it's meant to simulate that experience of these big mainframe computers. So this is what it this is what the simulator looks like. And again, I keep saying simulator because that's what we're doing here. Um, I guess technically it might be emulating it, but since the actual like logic of the computer was based on vacuum tubes, I think it is probably more accurate to call this a, call this a simulator as opposed to an emulator. Um, because it's, it's an analog computer, essentially. So, yeah, Knots and Crosses, or OXO, by um, EdSac. Well, it's working off code. I mean, it loads code, but the underlying operations of it isn't a CPU. In the in the digital sense, yeah, I mean it's a bit of semantics. Okay, to ask ask the question, the difference between a simulator and emulator, it's a bit of semantics. So, um, like an emulator, uh, okay, yeah, I don't, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to come up with a good analogy, but I'm, I'm struggling. So I'll just kind of describe it a bit more physically. Um, but a uh, like in and so let's take an older console. Like, hold on, one second. Hello, I'm back. So this is a, yeah, this is an Atari 2600 console, um, VCS, video computer system, is the full name. Make sure you can see it, there you go. Um, and inside of this device, inside of this console, is a, uh, a chip that contains software. And that software is the operating system, essentially, for, uh, that runs Atari 2600 games. So you plug a game in here, uh, it does look like a stereo, yeah. So you plug the plug the game in here, and then the software in the system loads the software in the game, and then we experience that on a TV when we plug this into a TV, right? So this is uh, to to emulate this system. That chip on here has code on it. You can take the code off of that chip and run it in a virtual machine on a more modern computer. So, like. Uh, so my computer that, that, that I'm streaming from here has enough memory in it to do all of the things that the chip in here could do and could interface with, and it can simulate all of those interfaces to that chip. And so I am actually running the code. If I, if I dump the code off of this ROM into my computer, I'm actually running the original Atari VCS code and then playing a video game on top of that. So that's why it's emulation. Um, I'm emulating that in there. So the actual... So I'm not like pretending to be v to v to be a VCS. I am actually using a VCS on my PC, but 
not physically, just virtually. Like I've taken the, 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 the concept of this that was already virtual and I've put it somewhere else and I'm using it again. For the EDSAC, there is no virtual there, there. There's no code that defines how the EDSAC works. There's a set of operations that you can write to address it, but the thing you're addressing is a series of tubes, basically, to go back to that cliche about the internet. It's a series of tubes and the hoses and stuff. Um, so kind of like uh, computer space, it's logical circuitry. Uh, it's, it's wires that um, go this way if they get a certain impulse, and they go this way if they get a different impulse. And that's how they make the decisions that render the game that we see, and they're physically wired. So if you break a wire, it's going to do something different. Um, that's not how it works in code. If you, write, if you write a game in code, you're going to have a conditional statement. You'll say, if this, then do that. Uh, that decides do this or do that, um, whether the ball bounces that way or the ball bounces that way. Um, whereas in a, an analog game like Computer Space or the first Pong, it's wiring that makes us those, those decisions. Um, so that's why we can, I mean, that was, I don't know, I don't think that was a very good explanation, but maybe, maybe it makes sense. But this is, this, this can be emulated, um, but EDSAC can only be simulated, I think. I, I don't know. I mean, again, it is semantics, and I don't know if it matters too much. In either case, we are, uh, you know, we're able to access it in certain, certain things we are able to access and we can recreate, certain things we can't. The big thing that we can't recreate certainly is a, um, uh, a, uh, a vector display. So you really cannot, I mean, you can simulate a vector display on a raster display, but you uh, definitely can't emulate it. Um, not with an LCD screen like, uh, like what we have here, um, but because it, it has to do with the physicality of the, uh, the technology. So anyway, let me put this down. So I don't know if that makes sense. I, I think probably that's a discussion we can have in more detail when I talk about platforms. I think that's Thursday or Wednesday um, where I talk about that. But as to, to Kelly's point, it definitely looks like a stereo and that's definitely on purpose. Um, kind of like the Magnavox Odyssey with the wood paneling, it's meant to look like it belongs in the home alongside your hi-fi stereo, which also has wood paneling on it. Uh, and even the idea of the, the cartridge systems, like, hang on a second. Um, This is getting into tomorrow's demo a little bit, but uh, this is a cartridge. Ah, if I can get it out of the box. These boxes are pretty, pretty bad shape and kind of fragile, but they're really cool, so I don't want to mess it up. So there we go. So this is a cartridge for a Channel F, and as, I mean, maybe you don't know what 8-track tapes look like, but this looks a lot like an 8-track tape, and it's uh, that's on purpose because the designers were conscious of the fact that consumers didn't know what a game console was, but they know what an 8-track player is. They have one for their hi-fi stereo system. So they would see this and kind of understand that this is something you plug into something else. And uh, that was part of the design here. But yeah, this is the Channel F console. Um, I don't want to get it out right now because it's pretty big, but I hopefully will have it out on Wednesday and hopefully it works. Uh, I say hopefully. Uh, it was in the same closet as my Vectrix for a couple years, and the Vectrix does not work, so I'm afraid that it got a little damp in there and got messed up a bit. But, you know, we'll see. Okay, so let me set that down. <laughs> anyway, I'm almost done with this lecture, by the way. Uh, let me, uh, but I, I don't know, if Kate, if that, if that answered your question at all or not, but that's my quick version, attempt at answering that question, and I can say more later if that's all right. Um, okay, so let me take a look here at, oh yeah, this was still running. This is, um, you can see it here. This is uh, loading this, no, what's happening here? Um, oh yeah, so this is, this is it. Uh, yes, this is just a video somebody made of using the simulator. So this software, like all the interface that you're seeing here, all these lights lighting up, um, these are, th these would be physical like light bulbs. Um, and then what you see in here is a rotary dial. Um, and that's, I don't know if you've ever used a rotary phone, but the idea is like you stick your finger on the number you want the dial, and then you turn the knob all the way around, and then you stick your finger, and then you let it go back, and then you stick your finger out, and then you do the next one. Um, so you have to manipulate it physically in order to input the, uh, the, the value that you want to play, like the actual um, uh, number that you want it to load for the, um, for the uh, tic-tac-toe position. So yeah, you can kind of see it here. Um, uh, what? I don't want to do picture in picture. Why did it do that? Ah, goodness. 
Okay, well, you kind of get the idea. It displays, the, the, the main thing that I think has, a, that gives this a compelling argument actually, is the fact that it plays the tic-tac-toe game field and like the, the actual three by three grid. And um, to go back to certain definitions of yours, uh, the idea that some kind of environment or scenario or simulation has to exist for it to be a video game, I think is met by this, the fact that you see this, this play field. Um, and you, you know, there's a bit of slippage here because we might need to distinguish between, like, I'm not a, like, there's no simulation of a fictional scenario. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not like a, a leading the battle, an army of X's against an army of O's or anything like that. Um, I'm really just marking positions. But what this is simulating is the experience that we would have in person if we sat across a table and just filled in X's and O's on a piece of paper. And I think that's the scenario that's been simulated here. It's just that we're sitting on, sitting at a table with a computer. And uh, as such, I think we are playing a video game if we play this. You know, again, it's debatable. I mean, is this video technology? No, um, this isn't technically video technology, but it, it is a visual technology. It is a screen. Um, so I don't know. I think it's got a, a decent, uh, decent argument. Uh, okay, so let's move in here to one more candidate. Actually, there's two more, but I don't have the video queued up here. I'm gonna have to Google it real quick, but the, um, the video, I don't have a video for this one either, but this is the oldest candidate that I've seen with a serious contention for being the first ever video game. In other words, lots of people have asked this question. Lots of people have given their version of this lecture. This is the earliest thing that I've seen anyone make a serious case for uh, actually being a video game. Um, there are some factors against it, and one of them is that it never actually was built, but it's, it is an important precedent in certain ways. Um, it is a patent. And you can um, look at it in Google Patents. Uh, I don't. I forgot to add the link to this page, but it's uh, it's fun to look at in Google Patents, by the way. Um, and I did have the link. All these other, these last couple of links are on my other computer, so I have to look it up here. But um, uh, the Google Patents are actually really fun to look through. Um, but I'll take a look at it here real quick. Should come up. Um, yeah, there we go. So. Yeah, Thomas Goldsmith and Ethel Ray Mann uh, patented this, uh, or, or you know, they described a device in in seeking this patent, and they were awarded this patent in 1948 um, for a cathode ray tube amusement device. And you can see the diagram here. This is like a top-down view of the cathode ray tube. So if you think of like the this is like the TV screen would be here. This is the back part of the TV screen. If you can kind of picture it that way, and then this is sort of a screenshot, a mock-up of how it might look on that. And so, let's see, can I rotate this in this view here? Ooh, what does this do? Oh, I didn't want to do that. Um, well, I think I have it in the slide, actually. Is this one? No, I have the other. That's the, the wiring diagram. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to see, but let me zoom in on it, maybe. Um, but yeah, I don't know how to re rotate it in this. PDF reader, but uh, I don't use this one usually. But if you look at it right here, you can, this is, there's an origin point, and then there are targets that you're trying to hit by changing the parameters on a missile. So if you think of it, it's kind of like Angry Birds. So you're thinking of uh, like launching a missile and trying to hit certain targets at different points on here. So uh, the idea is that you could compute that and with some wiring, uh, provide enough logic to simulate that based on, like if you think of how Tennis for Two, just use wiring logic to create a basic gravity effect with the bouncing ball. Uh, similar kind of math going on here to make this, and you could shoot these here. And the idea is that you could put a sticker on your screen and then try to hit the sticker. And, um, you know, that, I could imagine that being an amusement device. And certainly it seems like the kind of thing that meets, mo if it existed, if it actually was ever made, it would meet all the criteria that I think we, we've described in defining what we think of as uh, necessary for there to be a video game. So, I, I mean, it's debatable, but uh, I think there's a pretty decent argument here. Again, I wish I could rotate it, but hopefully you see how that works. Um, all right, so the other, and what was I gonna say? I had another point about that, but I've, I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at one more example. And I think I, oh, I do have the video here, good. Um, this is another example, and I don't have a, let me see if I can find a good picture of the cabinet. So you remember I said that computer space was installed in arcades. These are places that actually already existed that, that had games in them. 
and they were things like pinball machines and things like like this. So let me kind of um, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Can I zoom in on this? I won't even let me right click. This is a auction site where you can buy one of these, but I don't want to buy it. Um, do it like that. So yeah, good. So if we think back to our definition of video games, and I'll just jump back to it right here, we included things like it's something that's playable through a screen, there's an interactive experience, there's a simulation, there's a goal, there's there's participation, there's electricity, uh, there's some kind of electronic uh, scaffolding that makes this possible. And I think we could actually meet most of these criteria with this device. And I, I should say that I mean this argument somewhat facetiously. I'm not really invested in actually making this argument, but let's take a look at the different things that this device does. This is called Spear the Dragon, um, and this is a, a cabinet. It stands up. There's a video I can show you of someone using it. Uh, the way that you would use it is you, you test your nerve. It says um, it's got two knobs, one on the left, one on the right, and then it's got a slot to put a penny in. The idea is you put your penny in the slot, grab the knobs, and then hold on as long as you can because it's going to start electrifying you. It's going to actually pass electrical current through your body as you hold on to these knobs. And your challenge is to hold on as long as you can. And while you hold on, this individual is going to work his way across the um, across the bridge. And if you hold on long enough, he his spear is going to it'll actually go behind the dragon, but it'll appear like it strikes the dragon, and the bell will sound, and you will be declared a winner. Um, so. There are many things about this that actually meet the requirements. We have an interactive component, meaning you have to hold the knobs. If you fail to do that, the game ends, right? So you have a job to do. You have a, an action that you're performing by continuing to hold those knobs. You have electricity being involved. Uh, you have a simulated environment in this scene with the bridge. Uh, you have a character that you play as, which is this individual with the spear. You even have, uh, there's actually a pane of glass in front of this, so you actually have a screen that you access this world through. Um, it's just you don't have light dim like projecting the screen like you would on a TV, but it is a projection of a fictional scenario that you participate in by uh, electronic means. So I, I think, you know, I offer this not really as a strong argument for actually this is the first video game, but as a way to show that our definitions, it's very hard to create a airtight definition because I think this meets many people's definitions uh, for a video game, and yet, you know, honestly, probably isn't. Um, so uh, this was 1926, by the way. So if we were to kind of think back, it it kind of kind of makes sense as uh, certainly earlier than uh, cathode ray tube amusement device. So just a thought. But let's take a look at it in action and see what we think. This is a video, I believe, yeah, of someone playing it. And let me kind of skip ahead. He's basically talking about it and describing it. Uh, this doesn't have closed captions, so I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he plays it at the end. Yeah, there he goes. Let's see how he does. Yeah, there he goes. He's getting electrocuted. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty hardcore gaming, right? Um, it actually reminds me of, uh, I have to look up the year of it, there, there's an art game called Pain Station that it's like Pong, but if you miss the ball, you are injured in some way, like either through heat or electricity or like a needle. <laughs> yeah. He's going to do it again. All right, so certainly not a game for everyone, but uh, I think something that meets many of our criteria, and if nothing else, is a really interesting example. And you don't actually use anything, um, I mean, win anything that I know of, Kelly, although I suppose you could maybe give out tickets for it in an arcade system. Um, basically, you just prove your strength, so you just impress everybody. <laughs> so whatever, right? Um, oh, yeah, actually, so uh, Matty K is mentioning uh, using uh, oscilloscopes in physics, and that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what that's, those are meant for, right? I mean, that's what those uh, cathode ray tubes were created for that purpose originally, and then people found out you could also display imagery on them, and then like, oh, yeah, let's make TV. You know, so it was something that kind of becomes a uh, backwards way into consumer use. 
so that's the that's my final candidate, uh, my final example that I want to propose. Even though, as I said, it's somewhat facetious, um, I think there are many interesting things raised by this uh, by this um, gentleman and his uh, his device. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, there's actually is. I mean, you're kind of joking about it, gamers being masochistic. Uh, I mean, the idea of like hardcore gaming and like the sort of macho aspect of, of that term is something, yeah, and the idea of grinding, right? I mean, or, or like uh, think of, uh, or just like, um, yeah, I was gonna say, was just, I was about to say speed runs or um, uh, what's the, uh, the, the, the way you, there's a, a constraint, like permadeath constraints for speed runs or uh, what's the, there's a term, it's, it's named after the person who did it first, but it's like a, a way of playing Pokemon where you don't revive your Pokemon um, I can't think of the name. But yeah, certainly the idea of arbitrary and even really ridiculous constraint is something that gamers, yeah, that's what it is, Nuzlocke, thank you. Uh, or think of like, you know, Twitch plays Pokemon. Uh, I think constraint is always a, is a really interesting uh, avenue for aesthetics in video games. And constraint often can be very arbitrary and very, um, you know, very, uh, you know, li literally painful in some cases. Uh, I'm thinking of examples of like like Pain Station, like I mentioned, or uh, the Giant Joystick. Um, I think even there are certain certain games that uh, we may look at later that are uh, technically art games, but they are incredibly difficult to look at. Uh, like they they physically like like they're the kind of thing that if you have any kind of sensitive sensitivity to uh, strobing light, like photosensitivity, uh, just do not play them. But even, I don't have that. But even playing certain games. Uh, um, that I don't have, I, can't, I won't even name them now because the names are complicated and it's, they require explanation, but they are very difficult to play physically. Like, I'll just put it that way. But there's something I almost, that I enjoy about that difficulty and that it's not quite painful, but you know, it, there's, there's a real sense of uh, friction there. And I, I kind of like that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's take a look at the, at the slideshow. Now, um, lots of candidates here. Again, I don't. I, I'll, I'll put my image for Spear the Dragon into this uh, slideshow. I just didn't have time uh, over lunch because I was eating my beans. But um, yeah, lots of candidates here. So what do you think? Um, you don't have to answer this right now because I'm going to wrap the stream up. I'm tired of talking. I need to go drink some tea and let my my throat recover for tomorrow, I guess. But um, you know, think about it. Like, what is the first video game? Uh, which do you? Th which of these do you think has the best? Uh, the best case, the best argument for uh, being the first video game. You may even know of other examples, or you may want to propose other examples, right? So the, the Channel F is the first home console system that used software-based cartridges. So th there actually is game code on this cartridge. Um, and so it has a pretty significant firstness to it. Um, and so there's a significant claim there that's certainly worth considering. Uh, it definitely came out before the Atari 2600, for example, which sometimes people point to as the first. But the Atari 2600, you know, it, its status was, like it was the first really successful home console system. Like the Channel F was not very successful, but the, but it was first. So, you know, it gets credit for that. Kind of like Galaxy game. Uh, okay, so here, that's, yeah, nothing's due for tomorrow, uh, as Maddie K just asked on Twitch. I'm not asking you to do any homework. However, uh, I would like to suggest, and I, you know, I can't technically require this, but I would recommend that if you have time, you have a, uh, a team, red, blue, or green, uh, maybe play around with scribble.io or Among Us or something together just to kind of, you know, connect with each other, right? The, the whole thing about video games, if you look at most of these games that I showed you, uh, notice how many of them are multiplayer, right? Even from the very beginning, Space War is a two-player game. Um, Computer Space is a one-player game. Spirit of the Dragon is one player game, <laughs> but most of these are meant to be things that you do with other people. And that's really the fundamental thing that defines games is that it's an experience that we share. I mean, that if we look at throughout human history at games, like this, this presentation here is about video games, but there's a, a different presentation I could do about the history of games before video games. And what we see in cultures is that, you know, playing is a thing you do together. It's a kind of community building. So uh, I recommend that you, just, uh, you know, either now or later, sometime before tomorrow, perhaps, with your team, red, green, and blue, play a game of Scribble.io together and just kind of see how that goes, just to get to know each other a little bit, right? Um, I may do 
like for tomorrow's class, I don't have three lectures ready for tomorrow. I'm not going to do three lectures. I'll, I'll do one. Uh, but then some significant part of tomorrow, I think, will be much more informal than, than today was. Today was pretty... Uh, pretty tiring for me. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know how it was for you, but that was a lot for me. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, about to wrap up the stream then, I guess. Uh, are there any questions before I do? Anything else that you want to get in there before I, I shut it off? Um, I, I will tell you that what I'm going to do after I shut this down is I'm going to archive both of the videos from today on YouTube. Then I'll put those links in the notes for today in Canvas. And then, you know, we'll do it all again tomorrow. Well, not all, but I'll do, do more tomorrow. <laughs> no, no questions from Colin. <laughs> okay, good. All right, well, if you do have questions or if, if things occur to you, then certainly you all know how to get in touch with me now through your Discord. And if by chance you're watching this after the fact, uh, make sure that you're connected in Discord with your team. And if not, I will be reaching out to you shortly. So. Uh, all right, that's all for now. I will see you all tomorrow, 10 a.m. for another Twitch stream. And then uh, as part of that stream, I'll talk about the plan for that day and hopefully have some more detail about the rest of the week. All right, see you later. Bye.